I have a passion for weird and wonderful aircraft, which is why today we're taking a look at the Blackburn B-20. Now if this looks like somebody took a hacksaw to a flying boat in the back of an alley in the middle of the night and stuck it on some scaffolding, well, I wouldn't really blame you, but there was actually some method to the B-20's madness. Blackburn is well known for making some interesting design choices when it came to aircraft, but these were often innovative attempts at thinking outside the box, and the B-20 is no different. Its origins can be traced back to the summer of 1936. At the annual meeting of Blackburn Aircraft Limited, Robert Blackburn announced that the company was about to receive a contract for a new type of highly secret flying boat. This project was to be the culmination of a long period of research carried out by Major John D. Rennie, who had been trying to solve one of the biggest problems that plagued flying boat designers, takeoff and landing. Now, designing a flying boat that could take off and land was easy enough by that point, and people have been managing for about 20 years, but it came with compromises. Complex mechanical systems, such as engines, didn't particularly appreciate being exposed to large quantities of salt water, nor was it particularly ideal to have a rapidly spinning air screw strike the water, and so the engines, and thus often the wings, had to be kept high. This meant that flying boats had either a tall parasol wing, like those found on the PBY Catalina, or a gull wing, like that was found on the PBM Mariner, and often a very deep fuselage, and more often a combination of the three. This of course resulted in excess drag, which hampered performance. And additionally, to get the flying boat airborne in the first place, a large amount of lift was required and this meant having the wings at a relatively high angle of attack. Now, this was good for takeoff, but not so good once the aircraft wanted to cruise at altitude. The result had been that most flying boats were rather lacking in the performance department, but Major Rennie had been working on a potential solution that promised to revolutionise the performance of all flying boats moving forward. His solution was to build the flying boat hull in two parts, and have them connected by extendable struts. For takeoff, this mechanism would be extended, raising the engines and the propellers far above the water. It also placed the wings at the best angle of attack for takeoff and landing without having them to be fixed at that angle. This meant that once the flying boat was airborne, four powerful jacks could retract the extended section of the hull, and the flying boat could then cruise at an altitude with far less drag compared to more conventional designs. The principles of this invention were subject of patent 433925, which also included a new patent for a retractable wingtip float into the engine nacelles. All of this was subsequently incorporated into the design of the Blackburn B-20, which was submitted to meet specification R1-36. This called for a high-performance flying boat to replace existing general-purpose flying boats in the RAF and the Fleet Air Arm Services. All-up weight was to not exceed 25,000 pounds, or 11.3 tonnes. Maximum speed should be at least 230 miles an hour, or 370 kilometres an hour. And it was expected to have a range of at least 1,500 miles, or 2,414 kilometres. Though Blackburn's proposal was highly unorthodox compared to the rest, the Air Ministry was interested enough in the usefulness of its new patented system that they ordered a prototype as the B-20, with construction beginning at some point in early 1937. The B-20 design was a mix of conventional and unconventional thinking. The main upper section of the hull and the wings was constructed in the usual manner. The hull was built from a steel structure of transverse frames and longitudinal stringers, with the whole lot covered in flush riveted stressed aluminium sheeting. Construction of the separate lower section of the hull, often referred to as the pontoon, was similar to the main section, but a big difference here was that this is where a lot of the fuel would be stored. The pontoon itself was subdivided into five watertight sections, and four of these contained fuel tanks, which totaled some 976 gallons of fuel, or around 4,400 litres. Additionally, to provide some extra protection for this section, the plating that covered this lower section of hull was slightly thicker. 
This also allowed the use of countersunk rivets instead, which made the whole thing sit a lot more smoothly in the water. The main wing of the B-20 had three spars, and it was built in a single piece and attached to a series of specially strengthened frames built into the hull. Much like the extendable hull, the wingtip floats were also designed to retract as well. These retracted towards the tips of the wing, with the struts laying flush against the underside, with the floats themselves forming oversized wingtips, which gives an appearance similar to the fuel tank wingtips that were found on a lot of post-war, early Cold War era jets. Construction of the B-20 took place in Blackburn's new Clydeside factory in Scotland, but due to the unique nature of the design, and other orders prioritised for the fleet Air Arm and RAF, the B-20 took some three years to complete, and it would not leave the slipway until early in 1940. Details of the original proposed design seem to be almost non-existent, so it's difficult to tell how much the finished product actually differed from the original drawings but it appears there were three main differences. It was heavier, it was more powerful, and it seemed to have an additional crew member. As built, the B-20 had a wingspan of 82 feet, or just under 25 meters, a length of 69 feet 8 inches, or 21.2 meters, and with the hull extended, it had a height of 25 feet 2 inches, or 7.6 meters. Although the prototype itself would be unarmed, planned production models would come with eight 303 caliber machine guns for defense. Two were mounted in the nose, two would be in a dorsal turret, and four would be mounted in the tail. The B-20 also had a limited offensive capability as well, being capable of carrying either two 500 or four 250 pound bombs in a couple of small cells that were located in the wing between the engine and the fuselage. The crew complement now stood at six, a first and a second pilot, a navigator, bomb aimer, engineer, and an observer. The bomb aimer sat in the extreme nose, where glass panels gave them some sort of notion of what was going on in the waters below. Behind them was a spacious flight deck where the two pilots sat, and behind them, on a slightly lower level, were the stations for the navigator, the observer, and the engineer. Though the B-20 wasn't designed for exceedingly long-range missions, it was designed to be operated remotely from far-flung and often basic anchorages. As such, the aircraft needed to provide some level of creature comforts for the crew, who may find the B-20 becoming their floating home for extended periods of time. And so, crammed inside the hull was an officer's wardroom with two bunks for the pilots, sleeping quarters for the other four crew members, a compartment for general equipment, which also came with a bench and tooling equipment for the engineer, and behind this there was even a small galley and a toilet. As for the necessary marine equipment, such as anchors, winches, boat hooks, etc., some of it was stowed within the hull, but some was also stowed on the pontoon itself, or on the underside of the main hull so that it could be more easily accessible for mooring operations. These operations were found to be remarkably easy, as with the hull extended, it acted as a stable platform for the crew, and because of this, the B-20 was one of the easier and safer flying boats to manage in harbour during poor weather. Technically, the B-20 could be considered more of an oversized float plane rather than a flying boat, as the extended hull essentially took on the role of a giant pontoon. It also made the B-20 rather tall. With the hull extended, the cockpit was over 20 feet from the water's surface, and this meant the only way of getting inside was to install a folding ladder that connected the main fuselage with the extendable pontoon itself. Though an innovative design feature, the split hull did result in an increase in the all-up weight, as did various reinforcements to the wings. The prototype was completed unarmed, but even so, it still had a nominal weight of 35,000 pounds, or just under 16 tonnes, which was about 30% heavier than the maximum weight specified by the Ministry specification. This extra weight is most likely the main reason for the aircraft's choice in power plant, because the B-20 used two of the massive Rolls-Royce Vulture 10s, which were 42-liter X-24 engines that produced approximately 1,800 horsepower at takeoff. 
At this point in time, the Vulture engine was still highly experimental in nature, and it was plagued by teething problems that would eventually lead to the cancelling of its development. However, it was one of the most powerful engines available at the time, and although it was in very short supply, the Air Ministry had specifically supplied them to Blackburn for the B-20, which gives strength to the theory that the B-20 had come out of the factory far heavier than expected. All of that being said, the B-20 was still far within the structural limits for its weight, and it made its first flight on March the 27th, 1940, with Blackburn test pilot Flight Lieutenant Harry Bailey at the controls. The B-20 performed well, and over several test flights it was confirmed that the design appeared to be mostly sound. Though it looked about as stable as an elephant seal resting on a small boat, the B-20's water handling was described as excellent. The extending hull also performed well, though in the air buffeting sometimes affected the smoothness of the transition, and the only notable concern was with the ailerons, which sometimes experienced fluttering. It was hoped that further testing would allow some minor tweaks to get this particular issue under control, but unfortunately this was not to be the case. On the 7th of April 1940, the B-20 was completing a series of high-speed test runs, during which it clocked in an unofficial top speed of 345 miles an hour, or 555 kilometers an hour. But on one of its final runs of the day, the B-20 experienced a serious case of aileron flutter, which led to a catastrophic failure of said aileron, and the aircraft was seen plunging into the waters of the Firth of Clyde. Of the five crew members on board, only two survived, Blackburn engineer Fred Weeks and Rolls-Royce engineer Ivan Waller. Flight Lieutenant Bailey jumped out too low for his parachute to open, and two other Blackburn employees, Sam McMillan and Duncan Roberts, were never found. Though it had only been flying for a couple of weeks, enough had been learned from the B-20 to prove that the extendable hull worked, and that it greatly improved takeoff performance in particular. Blackburn thus proposed the B-40 and the B-44. The B-40 was an improved version of the B-20, with a much greater operational range, something more akin to the short Sunderland or PBY Catalina. The B-44 was a proposed naval fighter, and a far more interesting concept. The use of the retractable hull would give the B-44 the advantages of a float plane without the drawbacks of massive amounts of drag, and it was proposed that the B-44 would be ideally suited for use in the Far East and in the Pacific Theatre, where lots of island hopping was often required, and where an amphibious fighter would be far more useful. Two B-40 prototypes were ordered in the autumn of 1941, and two B-44 prototypes were ordered in the following year. Unfortunately, neither would see the light of day. The B-40 was projected to have unacceptable single-engine performance, and it was cancelled in early 1942, and the B-44 was cancelled after an evaluation of a mock-up showed that they would be far too difficult to handle on the water in anything other than a clock calm. Because of this, the only surviving legacy of the short-lived but very interesting Blackburn extended hull flying boats is part of the B-20. In 1998, the wreckage of the aircraft was discovered when one of the Vulture engines was snagged by the net of a fishing trawler. The wreck site itself was classified as a war grave shortly afterwards, and the remains of the Vulture engine, which had half fallen apart in the netting as it was being pulled out of the sea, was put on display at the Dumfries and Galloway Aviation Museum in Scotland, where it can still be found today. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you of course to the patrons. Now I know I had said that there was going to be a long video coming out this weekend, but editing it has proven to be a far longer challenge than expected, and indeed the video is now coming out as a two-parter, because in total I think it's going to be almost three hours in length, which is why this video has gone up today instead. A big thank you of course to our Wing Commander tier patrons, our highest tier supporters. And I apologise if my narration today isn't at top of form, as I've got a bit of a lingering cough, and that has also resulted in me having a fairly dry throat at the moment, which makes doing a lot of speaking a bit difficult. So hopefully next time I sound a little bit more normal. But as always, thank you all for your continued support, and I will catch you all next time. Goodbye.